Rick Saucier has been teaching in higher education for 28 years, the last eight of which at Thomas College in Waterville, Maine. He was a first-generation college student earning his bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Maine at Presque Isle in 1982. He went into the retail management business with Kmart Fashion, starting in Waterville, then to New York, and then back to Maine. Five years after graduation, he decided to pursue his MBA at UMaine. He was recognized by the program. In 1991, he pursued a career ambition of teaching business in higher ed, first with Eastern Maine Technical College, EMTC. And while at EMTC, he pursued his DBA from California Pacific University. In 2001, he moved to central Minnesota to teach at St. John's University. In 2012, Hearing the call of family, he moved back to Maine to teach at Thomas College. He currently teaches a variety of marketing courses, the Business Capstone class, and for the Harold Alfond Institute for Business Innovation. Along the way, Rick has published three books covering a variety of marketing topics on retail store design, marketing ethics, and the experience of teaching in higher education. He has also written on a number of topics ranging from the ethics of stealth marketing to the responsibility that marketers have for consumer happiness to curricular issues facing colleges. Rick is a member of the Marketing Management Association and the Society for the Advancement of Management, SAM. He has presented at a number of conferences. Rick believes Maine's students can compete with anyone in the country, which came to fruition in March of 2019 when a team of Thomas College students he coached won two first-place honors at SAMS International Conference in Orlando, Florida. And I'm proud to say that one of the members of that team is a graduate of Thomas who is working at Marshall Communications now, Emma Dimmick. Rick resides in Etna, Maine, with his wife of 35 years. Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I've been strengthening brands through PR for over 35 years, and now I'm celebrating the success of executives, influencers, business owners, and entrepreneurs from all around the world, all of whom have cultivated their brands and broadened their networks through traditional and digital networking methods. Each week, I interview one of these interesting and influential individuals and provide an opportunity for you, the PR Maven Nation, to gain insights from their strategies and stories. So stay tuned for this week's episode, and thanks for listening. So Rick, to kick things off, tell us about your career and how you got into it in the first place. Well, real quickly for the listeners, this might be a little helpful. I am just turned 60 this past year. So when I graduated from college with my undergraduate degree from the University of Maine at Presque Isle, I actually went into retail management for 10 years. During that time, I really wanted to pursue my life interest, which was my career interest, which was uh, to teach at, in higher ed. So I decided to start pursuing my MBA through the University of Maine. And I was one of those students who actually took one class a semester and worked my way through that way. I obtained my degree and got my first teaching position at, at the time was called Eastern Maine Technical College. Uh, where I taught in the associate's two-year uh, business degree program. I was there for about 10 years, and during that time, I always uh, joke with my students because I always tell them that I know when you're graduating that you're going to reach a point where you say, gee, I'm ready to move on. I've had enough of schooling at this juncture in my life, but I tell them you may get the interest to continue your education further, and that's exactly what happened to me. 
So during my time at Eastern Maine Technical College, I pursued my, my DBA, my Doctorate of Business Administration, and obtained that. And so I wanted to teach at, uh, as much as I enjoyed my time at Eastern Maine Technical College, I wanted to teach at a higher level. And at that juncture in my family's life, my daughter was graduating uh, from college, and there was really nothing holding my wife and I back uh, from exploring. So I started looking around the country and fell in love with an institution in Minnesota, in central Minnesota, just northwest of the Twin Cities, called St. John's University, and actually moved out to Minnesota and taught there for 11 years in their management major. And again, it was a really, really good institution. I learned a lot about teaching in higher ed at that school, had some wonderful students that I worked with and wonderful colleagues. But at the same time, we were halfway across the country from our family here in Maine. My daughter had gotten married and was, you know, was looking to have a family of her own. And so we decided we would look to move back to Maine. And so I was very fortunate in that my wife's alma mater, mater, Thomas College, had an opening for a marketing professor right down my alley. And so eight years ago, we moved back to Maine, and I've been teaching at Thomas College ever since, and that's where I hope to stay till my retirement. Well, I think that sounds like a really wonderful career, and it's really great that your family has been able to stay close and you've moved around the country a bit. And now that you're back here in Maine, you're enjoying, you know, teaching at Thomas College, which, of course, I think has had a great trajectory over the past 10 years or so, certainly with Lori Lachance as the president. I'm very proud to be an alumna of Thomas, actually, having gotten my MBA there back in, I think, 1994. It is a coincidence that I happened to start the same year that Lori started her presidency at the college. And she has done a wonderful job at the college and has really managed to encourage tremendous investment in the college to where we have created new programs, a new academic building, a new dorm, and has really revitalized the the campus. So it's a good time to be at Thomas College. I believe it is, yes. And she has also raised the profile of the college statewide and regionally, I believe, too, because uh, she is really a thought leader. And I I think she and I both received our MBAs from Thomas the same year. So you and I share <laughs> that in common that we, we've kind of uh, been tracking along with her and her presidency of Thomas. Yes. And again, I think that with her and with Tom Edwards, our provost at the college, that beyond building up the the physical structure of the college, we've also really built up the profile and the the quality of the programs. And, And that's evidenced by the last three years, I've been taking students to the Society for Advancement of Management Conference. This is the oldest management organization in the United States. And uh, the students compete against other colleges from around the country in various academic competitions. And three years ago, we finished third. Last year, we finished first in two two different activities in the country. And then this past year, again, the students have placed in either first, second, or third in a number of different competitions. So that tells me that our students are second to none uh, in the country. Well, and I can certainly vouch for that because I think uh, one of the team members that helped your team win two different awards last year is now one of my team members at Marshall Communications, and that's Emma Dimmick, who graduated in three years with a four-year degree last year as valedictorian. So I'm delighted to have her as part of my team. She is just amazing. Yes, uh, she was a one of my favorite students to to teach, very priceless and one of the best writers uh, I've ever encountered. Yeah, she's doing a really great job and boy, she just can she has such a great work ethic and I think that comes from having grown up on the apple orchard that was run by her family in the town of Madison, Maine, North Star Orchards where I think she still works on the weekends to help her parents to not only cultivate apples, but to sell all the wonderful products that they sell in their gift shop there. So 
it's been really a great relationship that I've had with with Emma and her family over the years. Yes, again, she's been a, a wonderful student to work with, and she will do uh, nothing but good things in her life. I, I, that's easy to see. Uh, yeah. I was just yeah. I was just fortunate to be uh, one of her teachers. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm fortunate to be her employer now, so I'm I'm grateful for that. So, Rick, what is your best how-to tip for PR, marketing, social media, or personal branding? I think I would give three pieces of advice. Um, the first one, I always tell my students, I hope that if they have no other takeaways from my class, that they take away the following. And that is that you always target first and then create a strategy. So target first, strategize second. Everything you do should be around the target market. How can you know how to communicate to that market? How, or in public relations, would be your target audience. How do you know how to effectively craft a communication unless you understand who that, those people are that you're trying to reach? And then obviously the appropriateness of choosing the right media to, or communication channels to go through that will reach that particular audience. So I would say target first, then create your strategy, strategize second. The second point I always like to make is that, you know, in marketing, there's a term that's sometimes used, I think, that's called sexy, if you will. And so a lot of times, you know, we run across ideas, marketing ideas that are fads or that may seem quote-unquote sexy, but really I think what's going to get help an organization succeed is to focus on the basics, the fundamentals. Start there first. And so, so that's critical. And then the third point I always encourage my students to do, and I think this is important for anyone in any profession, and that is to find the really good people in the field and find out what, what they say about the subject. Find out what they're writing about and learn from them. So learn from the best. So those would be three pieces of advice I would pass on. Uh, those are very good pieces of advice. Um, I I like your targeting advice because I believe that in marketing there's there's your targeted audience and then there's there's your message and then the medium like how are you how are you connecting your message with your targeted audience and you know if you're using social media for example uh, if you're using, if your target audience is a, a real young crowd, you might want to consider using Snapchat or TikTok, whereas now Facebook is actually more of what older people are using on social media. And and if you're using people who don't even have access to technology, you might want to use direct mail. So I think the message, the medium, and the targeted audience are all important aspects but but definitely targeting is is an important aspect of public relations and marketing and then i like focusing on the fundamentals um at my agency marshall communications we're really big into the details because it's all the details and you know little quote unquote little things like typos even just reflect poorly on your brand so we're really meticulous about spelling and punctuation and just proofreading. So I think the fundamentals are important. And yeah, I, as far as finding good people in the field, I, I appreciate that you assign my book, PR Works, to your students. And as you know, I have another book coming out soon called Grow Your Audience, Grow Your Brand. And uh, I hope that you'll also decide to use that in your classes too. Yes, I look forward to uh, seeing your new book come out and see uh, how I can work that through uh, my courses. I know the PR Works book that you wrote is very helpful and I use that book with my students as a complement uh, to my regular textbook. My, my regular textbook in public relations is written by an older author and he tends to write uh, while effectively about traditional forms of public relations, 
I really like that you bring to the table the importance of virtual, digital, public relations, and how to communicate properly through those channels. And so it really nicely complements the, the main text that I use for the class. And I receive a number of students' comments on your book that they really enjoy reading your book and at the points that you make and, and how you communicate those points in an effective manner. So, so my students have reflected very favorably on your book, and I will continue to use it. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I really credit one of my first bosses in public relations who has actually been a guest on the PR Maven podcast, and that's Chip Carey, who I worked for at Sugarloaf in the 80s and 90s. I, I'm really dating myself now. But when the commercial internet became a thing, Sugarloaf actually was the first ski resort in the country to have a website. And Chip really impressed upon me the importance of staying on top of technology for communications. And he knew at that time, and this was probably in the early 90s, he knew that this was going to change our profession, and it certainly has. I actually have a an opinion piece in today's Portland Press Herald about how we have to stay on top of technology, especially during COVID-19, to connect. Because, you know, if people aren't using Zoom, for example, or, you know, if they're not using social media, then they're really going to be even more socially distanced. So just to stay connected and we are, we are social creatures, some more than others. I know I'm a very social person, so I really enjoy connecting through social media, but I feel like everyone, even my 86 year old mother now is using something called a grand pad, which is the equivalent of an iPad, but it's kind of dumbed down to make it easier to use. So I feel that technology is is important. So I did include a lot about that in my first book, PR Works, and and more, more so in this new book that's coming out about the importance of of new and old ways of growing your relationships. So, Rick, when you're talking with your students, do you talk about measuring success in PR, social media, and marketing? Yes, that is critical because marketing, as you know, no, you no doubt know, is very, very expensive. And I like to preach to my students that for many organizations, they view marketing as a cost. And, uh, of course, when you think of a cost... Most people think of, well, how do we, you know, as a cost or an expense, how do we reduce that? I prefer to think of marketing and public relations as an investment. And so when you look at that as an investment, you want to get the best return possible on the dollars that you're you're putting into that particular public relations campaign, marketing campaign, advertising campaign. And so, as such, you have to have a way to measure your results. And as you pointed out just now, that it's harder to do in traditional forms of marketing and traditional forms of media. It can be done, but it is tougher. But digital media provides so many ways to measure, and most of the businesses today in in digital media will provide uh, ways to measure the results of your investment in that particular media. I think that's one of the reasons why they're so popular today for so many businesses because you can see, all right, here are the results. If I place place some form of marketing on Facebook or on uh, Google AdWorks, I can, you know, immediately get feedback, real feedback on the results of the placing those. So, So, yeah, measure is so important. I have a colleague, Bruce Kelsey, who teaches communications who really focuses on that particular area of marketing and and, uh, communications, if you will. Oh, that's very interesting. I'm glad that there is, that there are courses that focus on that and the curriculum at Thomas, because as you said, marketing is an investment and companies that are spending money on marketing need to be able to justify the expenditure 
you know, oftentimes the marketing people need to justify their budgets in order to get more money to spend. And they have to be able to also predict the future return on investment of a marketing expenditure or investment. So it is vital. And the unfortunate thing I think is that if you're only spending, spending a small, a very small amount, certainly with online advertising, for example, it is hard to really track the, the impact, but there are ways to, to track the impact regardless of budget. And it's important for students in college to learn that. And, and also as employers, we need to be teaching those methods as well. We have our Marshall Plan process that we go through with clients that includes a measurement dashboard so that clients can sort of track the metrics of success that are important to them. I feel that collecting email addresses is vitally important because I think an email list is one of the most valuable assets of any organization. So I feel like companies of all sizes should be gathering and always adding to their email list and, you know, the ability to communicate on an ongoing basis by email is, is important. Of course, you can't abuse that either. If you email too much, then people are going to tune out or or unsubscribe or block you, God forbid. (laughs) So, Yes, you you point out, I think, a really important point going back to our conversation about communication and a targeted audience or a target market. That is that what do you seek from them? What kind of behavior do you seek from them? And I I know a lot of organizations uh, are always looking for the sale, if you will, but it doesn't always have to be about a sale. It might be to, to drive some kind of behavior like to sign up for an email to receive emails from your organization or to drive them to your to your social media page. So again, you need to think in terms of goals and objectives and and what kind of behavior do you want to have your targeted audience engage in? Exactly. I mean, ultimately, a brand wants its people to know, like and trust them so they will do business with them. So Sometimes an email might be just a status report or just an update on how people are doing to to build the relationship. So I believe marketing is about building relationships that will stand the test of time, you know, that will be a long-term relationship of of people knowing, liking, and trusting your brand. And that's why so, I like you so much, Nancy, <laughs> because we think the same. We think the same way. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. That means a lot. <laughs> and you talked um, a, a little bit before about how old you are, and I think we're in the same age group. So we have seen a lot of changes in marketing over the over the years. Can you talk about how the profession has changed, especially in the last few years? Well, as you pointed out earlier, the the digital virtual world has opened up so much. There was a time, you know, I'll use Thomas College as an example. If we were to go back even, say, 20 years, we recruited students primarily through uh, correspondence, traditional correspondence, school visits, and so on. And while those are still important, now we're looking at how do you catch student prospects' attention, and it was interesting. I was just speaking with our head of marketing at Thomas College uh, a few days ago, and and now they're talking about all the different media, digital media, including, as you said, TikTok, and so how do you you attract uh, those students? And I often like to tell my students that, and a reason why I think it's important to focus on, on basics and fundamentals is that the marketplace is changing so quickly and is becoming so fragmented that these are these represent areas that you'll have to you know gain up to speed on them as these happen. I mean, who heard of TikTok 2 years ago? I mean, no one. And now all of a sudden it's probably the biggest social media site for, you know, teens and preteens. 
and and so you you know you have to stay on top of these things but i guess my point is and what i try to tell my students is that why i focus on fundamentals and basics in their class is that there's a good chance whatever job that they're going to engage in after they graduate that that job may not even exist today <laughs> and so if you understand the basics you can take those basics with you and apply them uh, in whatever position that you'll be engaged in going forward. Absolutely. I think that teaching students that we have to be lifelong learners is really important. I know that I have felt compelled to stay on top of trends, and I might not know how to actually do the technical aspects of everything that my employees are doing, but I understand the, the principles and the concepts of what we're trying to accomplish. And I think to be strategic is vitally important and and to be able to measure the, the, the return on investment as we talked about. And, and that's very smart thinking on your part because uh, I see in a lot of organizations today, unfortunately, I, I don't know if that's the right term to use, but there's older people who are in the lead positions, and so they're 50-, 60-year-old people who aren't necessarily technology proficient. And, and so if you have that good understanding of the fundamentals and understanding the importance of targeting and the importance of how you want to communicate, you can find people who have that technological expertise who can, you know, can handle the right type of media and how to get through that media to the to the audience. Absolutely. The most important thing is to understand the why. <laughs> like Simon Sinek's book, <laughs> Start With exactly. Why. Yeah. And how has your teaching evolved over the years, Rick? Well, I, you know, I, I like to say that I also am a lifelong learner, and so I'm always learning new ideas and new ways and new techniques. One of the principal ways I try is uh, to do lots of reading in the field. As I mentioned previously, find the good authors in your field. Like, for example, I think in branding, one of the better authors I've run across is uh, Bernadette Jiwa, and that's J-I-W-A for your listeners. She's actually out of Australia. She's written uh, a couple of different books, but she also has a great blog, uh, and the blog is called thestoryoftelling.com. Again, that's thestoryoftelling.com. By the way, I have no connection with GWA at all. Like I say, she's out of Australia, but she thinks the same way you and I do, Nancy. Again, that's, I think, a reason why I like her so much. I suspect you probably have heard of Seth Godin. Yes, he's, I think, one of the premier authors in the marketing field and has written a number of, of books. And, and what I really like, and I believe he has a blog as well, but his books are very short and easy to read, yet very informative, and often you can take his ideas and immediately put them to use. So, so he's another author I, I like a lot. And then a, a third one that's fairly new on the scene is Jonah Berger. He is out of the Wharton School of Business, and one of his books he's written is called Contagious, which is a nice way of, the idea is, how do ideas catch on? So he talks about his own observations and how he's encapsulated that into a, a nice, easy-to-understand format of what you can do to try to get your ideas, your marketing to catch on with other people. So so those are like some of them. So I do a lots of reading. I think it's important for me, not just in my field. My field is really twofold because I have my, my marketing field that I teach in, but I also, as a teacher in higher ed, I also like to pay attention to what other teachers are doing in the field. And, and I think in business, we would call that best practices. And so I try to find the best practices of different teachers in different fields and learn from, from those ideas. And, and it, it doesn't have to be in business or in marketing. If I can find a science teacher who has a great idea 
that I can employ in my classes, you know, I can I can adapt to my classes, then then that's what I do. So I'm always looking for new ideas. Obviously, technology with our students is very important, so I have to make sure I'm, I'm readily available with technology. So like in my public relations class, my students are now required to go on uh, Twitter uh, and take part in Twitter, which surprisingly, I find most of my students are not on Twitter. And so it's important for me to have them get on Twitter as the, as you know, the, the front line for the public relations person to get their, their story out or to immediately react to anything going on in the press about your organization. So, so you know, the idea is to, to get students to work with technology. I also have them get on LinkedIn as well and get them introduced to LinkedIn and understand the, the need to work with uh, a social media site that is very professional, if you will, and to understand how to act professionally on LinkedIn. Well, I'm glad that you're encouraging them to be active on both Twitter and LinkedIn. And yes, Twitter is really a great place to connect with journalists um, because most journalists are on there throughout the day. (laughs) And if you can help form a relationship with a journalist on Twitter before you actually pitch a story to them, that really puts, that gives you a leg up over those PR people who are not participating in the conversation and yet there is definitely an ongoing conversation every day throughout the day and night (laughs) on Twitter so I really enjoy that well we're going to take a quick break and be back with our conversation with Professor Rick Saucier from Thomas College shortly but first I want to mention that we have our PR Maven podcast listener line And if you'd like to call in at 207-620-9075, you can ask me questions, share feedback, or give me ideas for the podcast, including ideas of future guests. So I look forward to hearing from you. And right now, we're going to take a break and be back with more in just a moment. This podcast is all about growing your network in order to strengthen your brand. In my 30 plus year marketing and PR career, I have seen many organizations waste their precious time and money on marketing because they're trying to obtain success without any strategy to achieve their goals. So many organizations and companies suffer from what I call the shiny object syndrome, trying every new fad that comes down the pike. That's why I created the Marshall Plan 15 years ago. We have done over 100 of these plans for clients, helping them to get out of their day-to-day routine to identify their goals, solidify their brand story, focus in on their ideal customer avatar, analyze their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and create a realistic budget and measurement dashboard. We create the Marshall Plan collaboratively with our clients over the course of three months. We have a 65-step process to create a highly customized, actionable plan. And it's not like we come in and say, we are the consultants from away and we know everything. Instead, we come in and say, let's sit down at the table with your leadership team and we'll bring our expertise in what's working in PR and marketing. And our client team brings their knowledge of what's working in their organization. And together, we come up with a really amazing plan. For many, it's been a transformative process. I have watched how teams have come together and their faces light up because they have such a sense of accomplishment and they're so excited about the future of their organization. We help our client figure out the best way to implement the plan, sometimes using people within their organization and sometimes with our help. We would love to chat with you about how you can expand your network and achieve your marketing goals with a Marshall Plan. 
Go to marshallpr.com slash marshallplan to learn more about the process, or better yet, send me an email at nancy at prmaven.com, and we'll set up a time to talk and get started. And now back to our conversation. Welcome back. And today we're talking with Professor Rick Saucier from Thomas College. He's a professor of marketing and public relations there. And I want to dive right back in with more questions. Rick, what do students expect from a college education today? That's a good question. I think most students, I think, who are studying business, marketing, are doing so, to be really frank, they are hopeful that they're going to get a uh, a better job, a better career, and a better life. And that's fine in and of itself, but it's also important to understand, uh, and, and part of what I try to do as, a, as an educator in higher education is to encourage students to learn and to explore and to become a better communicator. I often tell them that, that a survey that is sent out to employers from around the country that I've tracked over a number of years always looks for uh, always looks at what do employers want from graduates of business programs from around the country and for a college graduate there these three factors always percolate to the top almost every single year and no special order but they want graduates to have a strong work ethic to have a positive attitude, and that can communicate effectively. And so, you know, I try to work in all three areas, but to be really honest, the first two are more personality traits, and most people, like Emma, either have it or they don't, but I try to work with developing that as much as possible. But I really work hard with the students to help them to learn how to communicate in a much more clear, succinct manner. What I find is that students don't realize that we write more than ever today when we stop to think about about that, right? Because how do we communicate today? We don't do as much in person as we used to. We're uh, posting social on social media sites. We're sending emails. There's a few people, I think, that still blog and, and so on. And so we text. And so we're writing more than ever, and it's important certainly for your professional life that you learn how to communicate using the clearest, most specific vocabulary as possible so that the, your message is being understood properly by the receiver. And, and so I really try to, to promote that in my classes. But, but I think most students are hopeful that they're going to learn what they need to do to hopefully be successful in, in their business and professional lives, to be honest. Yeah, I'm glad that you emphasize the importance of writing because really, you know, for example, when, an, when a college student or college graduate is seeking a new job, they're probably going to be corresponding by email with a prospective employer or recruiter in advance of an actual meeting. So, the ability to write, even to write good emails, uh, will be a reflection of their capabilities and their personal brand. So I think the ability to write not only clearly and concisely, but to have a brand voice that represents who you are. You know, I, I have a professional and serious side, but I also love to laugh and love to have a good time and enjoy life. So in my writing, I try to reflect that, to reflect my personality and not be always really buttoned up and serious. So I think that brand voice is important. And actually, that's another thing we include in these Marshall plans that we create is is the voice of the brand so that you can be consistent. And again, as we talked about earlier, connect with your targeted audience. Yes, and, and uh, first of all, I think you do do that very well, and it certainly shows again in your PR Works book. Your voice and your personality clearly shines through and I think helps to convey the messages that you want to convey. 
And I'll go back to the author, Bernadette Jiwa, in her blog, thestoryoftelling.com, because that's really what she's all about, is about brands. And she says your brands should tell a story. And I'm a big believer in that. And if you don't have a story to tell, then you probably don't have a whole lot to communicate to your, you know, to, to the marketplace. And so you need to figure out what is your story. What, what do you want to say about uh, your business and your company and who you are and what you're all about? Exactly. Right. And I think that um, it's okay to include some aspects of your personal life in your story, because that is part of what differentiates you and makes your brand what it is. I think some people are afraid of incorporating personal aspects in their professional brand. But, you know, as we've talked about, especially with people working from home and doing Zoom calls where their kids might be running in and out of the <laughs> out of the computer picture that's showing to others, you know, we, we are humans with a personal and a professional life and background. So when I'm helping people craft their personal brand manifesto, I try to incorporate things that they've done in their personal life that have made them who they are. Yeah, I think that there's an old line that I ran across once that says that said that people want to do business with another human being. And while technology is great, I think in the end, as you said, relationships are what's most important. And and so people want to do business. Uh, they want to interact with another human being. And so to that end, I think it's important for organizations to do what you just said, to interject some of themselves, their personality into the business and into the stories that they want to tell in their branding. Absolutely. And I sometimes your story has to do with, you know, your parents' story or even your grandparents' story. I know that the the summary that I have on my LinkedIn goes back to my grandfather in Germany who was a uh, train station master, and he always wanted to keep the trains running on time. <laughs> and that's how I feel sometimes running a PR agency. you got to make sure the train leaves the station on time and arrives on time and you deliver everything as promised. That's a, yeah, and again, uh, you know, something I could have said at the, I guess, at the beginning of the podcast is that I grew up in Arusta County and I grew up in a really, to be really frank, a very poor family. And, and back when I was a, a child, basically, you didn't graduate from even high school because there really wasn't much for career opportunities. And so basically you, you either went into the shoe factories or you went to work for a farmer or you went to work for the potato processing plants. And to that end, my older brother was actually the first person in my extended family on both sides to graduate from high school. And then he was also the first one to graduate from college, and I was the second and so I, I think that speaks to a lot of what has driven me and who I am and what I'm all about. And I think I like to think I interject all that into my classes as well. Yeah, I think that's great. You know, you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth and you've earned everything that you have. And I think that probably your students can appreciate that, that, you know, where you've come from and what your accomplishments have been. And I also, it helps me to connect with our present first-generation students, of which there's still a large number of students who are the first ones in their families to go to college. Exactly. Right. Yeah, we were talking about how what a shame it is that graduation is probably going to be a virtual event because I think that so many families want to celebrate the great accomplishment of their students and Hopefully they can figure out a way to do that while socially distancing. <laughs> we hope so. We hope so. Uh, it's sad because I know so many students have worked so hard to get to this point. And uh, like many campuses, Thomas College has a lot of end of uh, the school year celebrations of different kinds. And it's been kind of sad not to see any of those go forward. I agree. I agree. Very sad. So, Rick, 
Most successful people have a network of fans and followers, either online or in person or both. Tell me how you have built your network of fans and followers. It has been a conscious goal or has it happened on its own? Um, It has been, to be really frank, somewhat organic. I, I wish I could say that I had some kind of formal plan. When I say organic, it's really grown more from my classes than anything else. When I teach public relations, as I mentioned earlier, I understand the importance to be on uh, a couple of different websites, Twitter and LinkedIn in particular, and it doesn't mean that you're not on other social media sites, but uh, I always view Twitter as the front line for the public relations person, and certainly LinkedIn has a lot of great qualities about it that can be helpful for public relations and marketing and for your organization and really for you as an individual. But so, so that's really uh, a lot of my following over the years, particularly in LinkedIn, are certainly associates from the different institutions I've been involved with. I'm also heavily involved with the Marketing Management Association and attend many of the conferences for MMA, if you will. And so I have colleagues and associates from all over the country. But uh, a lot of my students who have graduated over the years uh, are on LinkedIn, and I'm very proud to say that they still reach out to me uh, continuously. So, for example, I said I was in Minnesota, I first moved out to Minnesota 18, 19 years ago, and uh, I have a number of students from from St. John's uh, University who still stay in contact with me, and, and we we have conversations back and forth on social media all the time. It's a, it's a great way to stay in contact. With Twitter, again, that's primarily been built up, to be really frank, because like many people, you know, we can only be on so, so many social media websites. You know, we only have so much time in the day to devote to them. And so I use Twitter primarily with my public relations class, and that's when I'm on it the most, and really use it primarily as a teaching tool, but at the same time, It allows me to, again, stay in contact with lots of different people. That's where I, you know, you post your podcast on Twitter, uh, one of the places that you post it. So it allows me to keep up with your podcast. I read uh, GWAS blog off Twitter. And and so so that's really, and, and if I could jump in real quickly, one of the points I try to preach to my students uh, very much is to find a way to compartmentalize their lives and so to have a professional side and their family and friends' social side. So one of the things I do is is I don't release my, – my Facebook side is my social side, and I just use that for my family and friends. The professional side for me is is LinkedIn and Twitter, and I try to use those sites in the most professional manner as possible. And uh, I try to encourage my students and teach my students to do the same so that if they're on Twitter and they want to use Twitter in a professional capacity to not post items that would not be, well, to say they wouldn't be very professional, <laughs> if you appropriate. will. Yeah, uh, exactly. Appropriate is a good term. And so, so to find a way to compartmentalize that out so that you don't cross a line any place and risk the chance of offending uh, someone, you know, even by accident. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important that people Google their own name from time to time and see what shows up because especially uh, college graduates who are entering the job market, you know, a a prospective employer is going to Google their name and going to, you know, see what shows up. Because I know if I'm hiring somebody who's going to be part of my professional brand, I don't want to have a lot of a lot of social media posts showing up of them getting really really drunk at a party or doing something that could be perceived as unprofessional. So I think that's very good advice that you're giving them. Yes. I would say the 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 three social websites I engage in like I say again, Facebook, Twitter and and LinkedIn and and so the nice thing about LinkedIn uh, is that I don't think you have to be on LinkedIn every single day. I mean, you certainly can be if you wish, but it's a, it's a place where you can check in a couple of times a week just to see what's going on and keep up. The other nice thing about LinkedIn, by the way, in my position at Thomas College, 
and certainly from St. John's University in Minnesota, is that other professionals, not just teachers, but in other organizations, oftentimes reach out to me, like you have reached out to me for this podcast. And so that's my chance to do a lot of networking. And, and that's another area that I always emphasize with my students, that it's important to network, that what you know is important, but who you know oftentimes is even more important and that the real value of like a, a site like LinkedIn and in, in networking is that oftentimes it's not necessarily who you know that can help you, but it's who they know. So someone may reach out to me, for example, on my network, say on LinkedIn, and ask me a question. And if I don't know the answer, I might know someone else who does that I can connect them with. So, so building up that network is important. But again, I would say compartmentalize those, those connections. Very good advice, and I would I would be sure to tell them that a prospective employer is going to be googling them, so they should Google their own name and see see what shows up. Again, that's also good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you've already given us several books and uh, blogs and websites that you use regularly, and and I appreciate that list. I've written those down, and we'll share those in the show notes, but is there another resource such as a book, a website, or an app that you have found helpful in your profession, and why is that? Well, if I can be a little slightly self-serving, I haven't mentioned, I have also written three books in the field myself. One is maybe slightly dated, but I think it's still very appropriate. It's titled Influencing Sales Through Store Design. It's a short read. Again, influencing sales through store design. And the idea is how can you design your uh, retail store? This is a brick-and-mortar store. Though I think some of the applications might in the book might work towards a retail website. But how can you design your store so to encourage more business in the store? And I come up with five main principles that through which you can do that. I've also written a book on marketing ethics, and it's more uh, specific topics rather than uh, this esoteric idea of thinking about what ethics are. So I look at specific aspects of marketing. For example, one of the topics is the ethical considerations in marketing to children. Another topic that I cover in the book is the use of fear appeals, the intrusiveness of marketing and how to address that because unfortunately most of us now do what we have like a I like to call it like a shield in which we try to filter out as many marketing messages as possible because we're marketed to so much in a given day so so how can you break through that shield and and how much intrusiveness is too much if you will and so, so those are some examples of some of the topics I talk about in, in that book. And then my most recent one is more if anyone's interested in the teaching profession, if you're interested in teaching in higher ed at the college level. And uh, I actually co-wrote that. I was the lead author on the book uh, and co-wrote the book with several of my colleagues in the Marketing Management Association. And the book is called Reflections on Life in Higher Education. And so if you'd like to learn more about what it means to teach in higher ed and what's involved, I think it's a really good book. Each of us, each of my colleagues, uh, I wrote the the introductory chapter, and then each of us wrote a chapter about our career paths and what we've done and and what you need to think about in terms of being successful if you do want to go into higher ed. Well, I did not realize you had published three books. So I'm very excited to read those, and I'm glad that you shared that with us today, Rick. That's really impressive. Well, thank you. Again, it's like my education in my life. As I said, when I got my undergraduate degree, I thought, I'm through with my education. I'm all done. Within five years, I found myself enrolled in an MBA program. When I got my MBA, I said, great, I'm done with my education. Five years after that, I found myself in a doctoral program. Well, my writing's been the same way. I always think, well, this is great. I've done this. I've managed to publish this this particular book, and 
and I'm done. And then I always find myself a few years, you know, a couple of years later, being bitten, I guess, by the writing bug and, and trying to take on a new topic. I totally can relate to that. <laughs> And uh, I have found this extra time that I've had during COVID-19 to be a great time to be writing and producing a lot of content, which having that content, of course, helps you with the find a, being findable online or discoverable for your unique powers and hopefully your superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, reflecting back on a topic we talked about earlier and really kind of leading into the writing part again, one of my challenges going forward, you asked how my teaching has evolved, and one of my challenges going forward is that, real quickly, Thomas College wrote a grant, and the grant was designed to try to find faculty who could eliminate textbooks from some of their classes to reduce the cost of higher education for students. And so I am have taken that on in a couple of my classes, and that will be something I'll be working on this summer, is to try to figure out how to incorporate and find content and create a class in such a way that students won't need to buy the textbook, but I can provide all the information they need. But just to reassure you, that's not in my public relations class, so I'll continue using your book <laughs> in my public <laughs> relations class. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm glad that you have an eye toward keeping a college education more affordable because I would hate to think that someone might not pursue a college education because of the cost because you and I both know that a college education just broadens your horizons and opens you up to so many opportunities and also allows you to meet people who will have an impact on your on your life and your career. I, I remember when I was going to college, my mother, who also had a college degree, said that it's not as much even what you're going to learn, it's the people that you're going to meet. And she was so right. It's It's interesting that she said that when I was still in high school, that she wanted me to go to a place where I would meet people who I would stay in touch with my whole life, and, and I definitely have done that. So kudos to my 86-year-old mother. <laughs> 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 so what is the best way for listeners from PR Maven Nation to get in touch with you, Rick? Well, I would say, I would suggest uh, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, two social media sites, LinkedIn uh, or Twitter, and then they can also reach me at Thomas College if they check out Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S dot E-D-U. And then my email account, which I certainly don't mind people reaching out to me that way, is S-A-U-C-I-E-R-R at Thomas dot edu so associate r at thomas dot edu okay well thank you so much for your time today rick this was a wonderful conversation and i really enjoyed it i hope that some of your students will listen to it and uh certainly emma and we didn't mention whitney Raymond, who also is a Thomas grad who has her MBA from Thomas. She she did the five-year program where she received her bachelor's and master's in five years. And she has been working for me for probably, I think, 10 years now. So we definitely have a cohort of Thomas grads at Marshall Communications, and we're, we're all the better for it. So Thank you, and I hope everyone in PR Maven Nation has enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And I hope you have a great day, PR Maven Nation. That's it for this week's episode. I'd like to thank you for listening, and if you feel that you've gotten value out of today's conversation, consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes or whatever app you're using to tune in. If you haven't subscribed yet, you should do so. I release a new episode each week, and subscribing will make sure you get an alert when there's a new episode. 
You can also join the PR Maven Nation by going to prmaven.com slash nation and clicking join. It's free and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you have an Alexa-enabled device, be sure to add the PR Maven Marketing Minute to your daily flash briefing menu. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.